Just a few weeks ago, there was a back and forth about whether Microsoft would kill off Paint or not. And while Paint might have escaped the axe for now, Microsoft made it pretty clear that they eventually wanted to go away. Which got me thinking. We have seen this before, but why do companies want to kill off products that are still used by many, potentially millions of people, and even loved by many? I'm Martin from TechAltar, you're watching the 22nd episode of the Story Behind series, and let's find out. So products that are seemingly successful get killed off all of the time. And as I kept thinking about examples, I kept coming back to three common reasons for their deaths. And let's start with reason number one, which I like to call the sacrifice. A good illustration of a sacrifice product would be Microsoft Paint itself, which the company declared as deprecated, meaning that it will be removed from Windows 10 as a default app and it will no longer receive updates. Microsoft's official explanation makes it pretty clear that they are phasing it out to get users to switch to its successor called Paint 3D. Just like the name suggests, this new app has many of the same features as Paint does, but it also has more of a focus on creating and viewing 3D files. Replacing the old with the new makes sense on paper, until you see the reactions of the internet to this move, which show that many of the millions of current Paint users couldn't care less about 3D and aren't exactly thrilled about making this jump. While Paint 3D can do a lot of what the old Paint could, it isn't a clear successor. It is something fundamentally different. So Microsoft forcing an app on people that they don't want seems a little, well, suicidal. But I'd argue that there is a logic to this change. Users generally dislike change, so leaving them the option to use good old 2D Paint would mean that most of them wouldn't switch even if they could. But if Paint gets sacrificed, millions of users will be looking for a replacement and Microsoft will be happy to guide them towards Paint 3D. Many will refuse, but even if just, let's say, half of the current Paint users adopt Paint 3D, then this new app will suddenly have a sizable user base. Now, I hear you asking, why is this new app so important that Microsoft would be willing to lose a lot of its users for it? And I think the answer is that while most users might not care much for 3D right now, Microsoft clearly thinks that it will be a hugely important part of the future. Like Facebook, Google, and Apple, Microsoft seems to think that AR and VR, or as they call it, mixed reality, will become the next big personal computing category. PCs to smartphones to AR our glasses is a path that people like Mark Zuckerberg and Tim Cook are, well, at least seriously considering. And if they are right, then 3D content will become hugely important and having a well-established and popular 3D editor with a large user base will become something of strategic importance. And with Paint 3D, Microsoft owns what might one day become by far the most popular casual 3D viewer and editor for a long time to come, simply because it is the default image editor bundled together with hundreds hundreds of millions of Windows 10 PCs. An enticing thought, for sure. If industry sources are to be believed, Google Reader would be another great example of a sacrificed product. Google's RSS feed aggregator, according to estimates, had at the very least 3 million active and very passionate users. The tool let them follow, find, and share online content, such as blog posts and news articles. Most businesses would be thrilled about a user base this big and passionate, and yet Google decided to sunset the product in 2013, citing a decline in users. Industry sources, such as Marco Arment, the founder of Instapaper, however, claimed that the real reason for Google ditching Reader was to focus its efforts on its social media network called Google Plus instead. That is where Google wanted people to discover and share articles. And remember, just a few years ago, Google Plus seemed to be the number one project at all of Google. It wasn't just a social network that was supposed to beat Facebook, but also the glue that would tie together all of the individual Google products, such as YouTube, Gmail, Docs, and so on. Again, a very enticing future. Now, we all know that Google Plus didn't become the runaway success that Google was hoping for, and it is also far from certain that Paint 3D will one day become the dominant 3D editor. But given the importance of Google Plus to Google back then, and the importance of Paint 3D for Microsoft's vision of the future, it is easy to see why an old RSS aggregator or a legacy image editor with a few million users would seem like a reasonable sacrifice. The second reason for a company to kill a product can be explained with a popular economic concept called opportunity cost. This might sound a little counterintuitive, but bear with me. Let's take the recent death of the iPod, for example. 
In 2014, the Classic was killed, and just recently the Nano and the Shuffle were axed too. Apple stopped releasing sales figures for iPods in 2014 when the company sold 14 million units. So even with falling sales, we can expect that the company had sold at least a few million units this year, meaning that they must have made at least some money for Apple. I bet that iPod competitors like Mighty would be over the moon if they sold as many devices as Apple did. So why wouldn't Apple just keep the existing models around to make money? Because of opportunity cost, of course. An easy way to think about this is to envision a physical Apple store. If Apple in a given store has two spots to display products on and knows that filling up one of those spots with iPhones will make it, let's say, $500 of profit per hour, while filling up the other one with iPods will make it, let's say, $200, then at some point Apple will just decide to use both spots to show off their iPhone instead. Doing otherwise would cost them $300 in lost profits per hour. Opportunity cost means that even if a product is technically profitable, if it is much less profitable than others, it becomes a bad investment. As products sell in smaller quantities, their costs per unit start rising. Overhead costs that don't completely scale down with lowering sales, such as software support, like having to keep iTunes updated for example, the training of customer support and salespeople and so on, all start adding up until the point where even a profitable product can become undesirable. The last and I think most straightforward reason on my list is integration, and products like Sunrise and Accompli might be good examples of this. They were a popular calendar app and an equally popular email client on Android and iOS, and both were bought by Microsoft. Soon after, both Accompli and Sunrise were, well, you know, sunset, because Microsoft used the talent they had acquired to build their own Outlook mobile apps instead. It is pretty common that companies buy startups for either their talent or some special patented technology, which they then roll into their existing portfolios. While doing so, they often also kill the original products, even though they might have an avid user base. So those are my three reasons, and I think there is a common theme to all of them. Surprisingly, that theme is quite <laughs> agricultural, because what these companies are really doing is pruning and herding. They are pruning their product portfolio, meaning that they cut off the less profitable and less strategically important parts to focus their resources on those that they truly believe have a future, while also herding users to move from the products without the future over to the products with more potential. And while this makes total sense for them, it means that we users just can't expect any product or service, especially one with an online component, to last forever or to continue working the same way as it does now. A somewhat related and very relevant example, and I promise this will be my last one, is YouTube. I don't expect Google to shut it down anytime soon, but Google does change how it works nearly every day. I'm a content creator that relies nearly entirely on the YouTube algorithms deciding that my videos are worth recommending to you, the subscription algorithms deciding to send you notifications when I upload videos, and the ad algorithms deciding to make money for me. Those algorithms can and do change all the time, and while they have been treating me quite well so far, there is just no way to tell if they will continue doing so in the future. So what is the key takeaway here? I think the takeaway is not to keep all of your eggs in one basket, especially if that one basket can change its terms and conditions and the way it operates at any time without asking you for permission. Which is a great segue into my other baskets, also known as my social media channels. I'm Tech Altar on all of them, and if you want to make sure that you don't miss out on my stuff, even if YouTube decides to change its rules, then be sure to follow me there as well. Also, I actually post a lot of cool stuff that doesn't make it to the channel, so if you like this stuff, you're probably gonna like that anyway. So let me know in the comment section below or over at Twitter what you thought about my analysis, and don't forget to join my main basket by subscribing to my channel and hitting the bell button next to the subscription button to get notifications. Unless, of course, YouTube changes its mind and doesn't give you notifications. In either case, I'll see you in the next one. Bye.